You're watching City Channel 4, your window to our community. Welcome to the program Music Therapy for Caregivers. My name is Jackie Ross and I'm currently working on my master's degree at the University of Iowa. I have focused my clinical research and my experiences and everything on music therapy with caregivers, specifically for self-care and facilitating relationship bonding between caregiver and care receiver. So for this presentation, we are going to start with briefly discussing what is music therapy and then go into the common needs and stressors that caregivers face. We will then look at ways that you can use music in your own life, as well as ways we can use music therapy with the caregiver and the care receiver. And then we're going to finish up with a little snippet of Better Future for Iowans, which is a program that I participated in. And then we'll have question and answers and then refreshments. That being said, I'm going to share some of what I found in the research. Each of you have very unique situations, so you may or may not agree or understand or relate to what I'm saying, but hopefully you should get something out of it. And if you have questions, please feel free to ask and Maggie will come around and ask. All right, so to get started, has anybody heard of music therapy before? Okay, good. Pretty much everybody, that's great. We are in the right place because we're going to learn more. Um, just to start off with a little comic, <laughs> Good news, Mr. Burgess, we've successfully removed that tune that was stuck in your head. Um, and there he is with the tune in the jar. So is that music therapy? Not really. Um, according to our national organization, um, we are an established allied health profession that uses music and music activities to address physical, psychological, cognitive, and social needs for persons of all ages. So basically, we use music as our tool to address the needs of each of our clients. Who are music therapists? We are university trained. We have education from universities, and we have clinical training within that program. We're board certified musicians and clinicians, and we have music interventions and a whole tool belt of activities that we can do with goals and objectives for our clients and their families. Are you all really um, well-trained musicians? Are you all have you all have great voices and play multiple instruments and things? But um, we all have a lot of musical training. Um, I would say that we all have an emphasis that we work on. My background is in vocal education, and that so that would be a more of a strength for me than for other people. Whereas others have more strength in guitar, or piano that kind of thing, but we're all musically trained and we have competencies that we've all passed and established that we have that skill, so. All right. So who do we serve? You can find music therapists working with people of all ages, from NICUs and neonatal babies all through the lifespan. Commonly, you can find us in schools, hospitals, nursing homes, other geriatric facilities, hospice, medical facilities like hospitals, etc. We also collaborate very effectively with physical therapy, speech therapy, and occupational therapy. There are a variety of goals and objectives that we can work on. Our goal is not for the individual to excel in music, but to enhance functionality in other areas, so we generalize it. So we can work on things such as reducing the perception of pain, using relaxation for stress reduction, emotional expression, those kinds of things. This is the biopsychosocial model, so there's three bubbles, biological, psychological, and social. And as you can see, everything affects everything else. So we can work on one area, but we'll be affecting the other. So if we work on pain management in the biological area, then we're realistically also working on our attitudes and our mood because our pain will be better, so that's psychological, which will in turn affect our relationships in the social area.
common caregiver needs and stressors. And like I said at the beginning, these are what I have found in the research, and you may or may not relate to some of them or all of them. How many? According to the National Alliance of Caregiving in 2009, there were 65.7 million caregivers in the United States at that time. 3.9 million are children. 12.9 million are adult children, so caring for like an aging parent. And then 48.9, the majority are adults caring for adults, so spouses or family members, siblings. And 34% of those are men. And then another interesting fact that I found, which is part of why this is such an important topic in my mind, is that one in five of these caregivers spend more than 40 hours a week caring for their loved one. And so that's a full-time job on top of everything else that life is throwing at you or that you are responsible for, that's on top of that. So some of the needs that I have found, I have put in a chart, and the ones that are in bold are the ones that I feel music would be most effective with. So things like stress management, coping techniques, uh, working on the role changes that come with caregiving, anger management, those kinds of things are things that music can be effective working with. It is less likely that we would work on information about educating about the disease or the disease process in that way. For the care receiver, same thing, the bold ones are where I believe music is most effective. And we can do life review, lots of reminiscence. We can effectively, and the research shows it, effectively manage pain management. We can provide opportunities for autonomy and self-worth. There are shared needs that come between both caregiver and care receiver, and we can affect a lot of those. Immune functioning, sleep difficulties, role changes, the quality of life and having those shared positive experiences are places where music can really make a difference. There are also many emotions that accompany these needs and concerns. Some of these can be difficult to manage and can be overwhelming. Music can be a great avenue for expressing these emotions or calming them down, reducing them. All right, so now we're going to go into music experiences and then music therapy. So we're gonna do music experiences for the caregiver and ways that you can practically use that at home and then music therapy for both the caregiver and the care receiver. Music experiences for caregivers. Self-care allows for better care of your loved one. Just as this airline attendant is telling us to put our own mask on first before we put on our child's, if we don't have that oxygen, we cannot effectively care and help our loved one that we are caring for. So when we self-care for ourselves, we are improving the quality of life for ourselves and the care receiver. This can also help provide meaningful shared experiences during these stressful times. Music can provide cues for relaxation, exercise, leisure activities, and social gatherings. So how can music help you? These are just a few ways that music is involved in our daily lives, just to get your mind turning. How many of you remember having lullabies sung to you as a child, or singing lullabies to your children, or to a neighbor, or somebody? Yep. It seems to be a very natural way for caregivers to soothe or help go to bed, um, to help their loved one or themselves go to sleep. Um, we can elaborate on this and take it throughout the lifespan. So um, there's a study in 2005 by Lai that talked about music and how it affects sleep quality, the length of sleep, and how much time it takes to fall asleep. So as a caregiver, you can use this to help you relax before sleep and help your sleep be more effective. If you wanted to try this for yourself, it is important to find music that relaxes you. There's always those ads that say this works or this is the relaxing song that you should listen to, but it's really a personal decision and you have to find what works for you. 
Um, typically, they have soft music with slower rhythms. It might be classical, or if it has words, it's fewer words. Um, it's a safe and easy and low-cost way to help benefit your sleep habits. And there are apps on phones or on CD players and music devices where you can have sleep timers where it will time out after a certain amount of time so you don't have to worry about it playing all night long. And there's also applications for background noise or preset playlists, those kind of things to help you. Another issue caregivers can sometimes feel is being isolated or alone. Music is one way to counteract that because just by nature, music is very social. It can provide opportunities for social engagement, interaction, communication. We can talk to other people about our musical interests, about their musical interests. We can express ourselves through the song or through whatever we are working on. When you're in a music group, there's often a sense of cohesion and pride as you're working together to put forth that product that you are creating. Stress and anxiety. Stress is harmful for our bodies and it overwhelms and interrupts the functioning of our daily lives. So we can use music, slow music, to help for relaxation, but we can also use upbeat music for stress relief, like this drumming circle. There are different kinds of relaxation and each one is unique. It's important to find the right one for you, just like the right song for you before bed. Deep breathing with relaxing music can be efficient and effective. It can help reduce anxiety. It's easy to do and it can only take a few minutes if that's all you have. So you simply can find a song to put in the background and distract from those other noises. You can breathe slowly in through your nose and out through your mouth so that your abdomen is going in and out so that it's very deep breathing. You can also do progressive muscle relaxation, which is where you are tensing and releasing different muscles in your body. There are scripts online available for those. And visualization and imagery is where you visualize a place that is comfortable for you. So for me, that would be a campsite in the mountains with the stars and the trees and a campfire. It's whatever is comfortable for you. Music can be a good source for stress relief just like Bill the Cat. <laughs> um, upbeat music will likely be a good cue for this. It can help focus, prompt, and maintain exercise. It can also distract from anxiety and discomfort, and it can be that outlet for expression, whether that's through what we are singing, what we are listening to, how we are playing. So how can you fit this in and help yourself exercise when we're all very busy and there's no time in our lives to do that? It doesn't have to be a time commitment. It can be simply taking the stairs instead of an elevator, getting off the bus one stop early, not taking the closest parking spot at the grocery store. Those kinds of things can be easy ways to just incorporate a little bit more exercise into your daily life. Creating a list of songs can also help prompt this. And you can do that on a music player, with a CD, on your phone. There are several apps that I have listed that you can download on a smartphone or on a music device and they are very good because you don't really have to think about what you are doing. The music workout will interval training and so it will do some slow songs, some faster songs to help you with those intervals. Tempo Run organizes your playlist and it keeps it at a steady beat so that you're running for one song and then the next song doesn't slow down immediately. It keeps it at the same tempo. And Fit Radio is what I use, and it has preset playlists, and you don't even have to do anything. You just hit play. So 15 minutes of moderate exercise a day is essentially three plus years added onto your life, according to Time Magazine. And 30 minutes a day is four years onto your life. That's pretty significant for just taking the stairs or walking just a few more feet. So now, music therapy for caregivers and care receivers. Why music therapy? It's cross-cultural and cross-generational. It is readily available. Children, adults, older adults, everybody can sing certain songs. For example, pretty much everybody of all age can sing You Are My Sunshine. It's a very happy song that everybody can sing together. There are also 
Many studies out there, a couple in particular, where music therapy is shown to be extremely cost effective. The one by Romo in 2007 is done by a hospice organization on the West Coast, and it showed significant cost benefits for the clients who had standard care plus music therapy. What do you mean? The cost benefits, with the pain reduction and with the amount of nursing care required, they were able to save money that way, and it ended up being, they did a retroactive study, and it ended up being almost $3,000 difference between standard care and standard care plus music therapy. Yeah. The biggest thing that I found in my research, as well as through my clinical experiences and Better Futures for Iowans, was that music therapy provided shared positive experiences for both the caregiver and the care receiver. Especially during a time of illness, it can be very difficult to go out and actually do things in the community, go to events, those kinds of things. The music therapist can help a person use whatever skills they have and constructively fill that time at home. So those leisure skills are very important. Adaptations and adjustments can be made so that music making is possible whoever and wherever you are. Music can pass the time, it can stimulate your mind, and it can also distract from pain. In 2007, there's a researcher named Lauka, and it was a giant survey of 500 older adults, and one of the common leisure activities was listening to music. And the strategies behind it was that it increased their mood and brought them pleasure, it helped with that mood regulation, and they used it for relaxation. Sometimes it can also be difficult to find suitable ways to interact together and have that common interaction. Music can provide familiar and normal structure for positive engagement. Relationships and communication are typically easier when you're both focused on that same common goal. So for example, there's a music therapist, Dr. Claire in 2002, she had eight pairs, one of the individuals had dementia and then the caregiver was there as well and they worked together and sang and danced with the music therapist helping them facilitate that by tempo or however adaptations they needed and they worked together on that common goal one woman described that even though her husband could not communicate verbally he could still hum their favorite song and he could dance with her so they reported enjoying having those few moments together Research shows that during music therapy sessions, families can temporarily feel as if they're in the role before the caregiving role came into place. So whether that's mother-son, brother-sister, father-daughter, so on and so forth, you can help re-experience those relationships by focusing on the music. This can also create meaningful moments where you are not caregiving and everyday normalized things are being done. Music can provide opportunities to write songs together, to create and music, make music at the same time. You can reminisce about past events and it can also normalize the environment. Songs can instantly take us back to a place or time. Reminiscence through music brings forth these stories, emotions, memories. We all have songs that remind us of our high school prom or a certain person a hobby, a time in our life, that song can take us right back to that place. Also, many of life's big events also have songs associated with them, like Pomp and Circumstance at graduation or your first dance at a wedding. It can be very, very powerful to sing a special song together and reminisce about the good old days. Music therapists can help facilitate these moments and help provide live music to work on these therapeutic goals. We can work on writing songs together, creating musical legacies, writing narratives, recording for loved ones, and quality of life. So the Better Futures for Iowans project is a project at the University of Iowa. It was a grant from the provost and the University Arts Share Committee. And Dr. Adamek in the back and the music therapy program received this grant to have us go into four nursing assisted living facilities in our 
community and do a music therapy outreach event. So we've done it for two years now, four locations over two years. We have a board certified music therapist that helps facilitate the session and then students from our program get to go as well and help lead and interact. Staff, residents, family members, everybody's invited all at once to come and experience together. So through this, we used music to provide these shared positive experiences. We worked on that common focus of attention. We used songs for reminiscence. We did physical movement with top hats and parachutes and all sorts of fun things. So here's just a few examples. We have some pictures um, here at the bottom. It's a mother and a daughter. They're playing their eggs together. They're what? They're playing egg shakers together. Oh. So they're going to the beat together. <laughs> yeah, the rhythm. And then on the other side, there's she was pretty unresponsive for most of it, but she would sing along, and she was aware that her daughter was right there with her. And then over here, we have um, one of our own music therapy students, and she was helping to have them hold hands and experience that physical touch. We use things like parachutes for physical movement through music. The music cued our movements. We had all ages there. Everybody enjoyed it. It was great to have the little ones as well as kids and teenagers, older adults. Are you able to tell us uh, the locations? Um, I think so. Are you, are you able to tell us the locations in the community where these, where these the studies took place? Um, they were older adult nursing facilities that were, I don't think we can actually say the specific name of where they were at, but they were four different locations each year. So we're always looking for more, and if you know of a facility, you can always ask their administrator to push for music therapy. So you don't have to necessarily be involved with Better Futures to be involved with music therapy. We often do individualized sessions, but we can do group sessions as well. Music is a cost-effective and accessible tool. We can work on biopsychosocial goals, like I described at the beginning. It can provide opportunities for social interaction, communication. For the caregiver and the care receiver, we can provide those shared positive experiences. We can work on teamwork, bonding, and have that common focus of attention. We can work on managing stress, pain, anxiety, and we can develop effective coping techniques as well as those leisure skills. This has been shown over and over again in the research as well as through my clinical experiences and through the Better Futures for Iowans program. So how can you find a music therapist? <laughs> That's the question. Iowa City Hospice has a couple that you can talk to Maggie about after. There's Iowa Chapter of Music Therapy and the American Music Therapy Association that are two regional and national associations. On their websites, they have places where you can search and find. So if you have a family member on the East Coast, you can still find a music therapist for them out there. And then West Music locally also does contractual music therapy work. And those uh, web addresses are also on your handout. So our take home points that we were just going over is that music is beneficial for the caregiver. It can help reduce that stress. It can bring more effective sleep and essential exercise that we need. It can be great for the care receiver individually, but also as a bonding between the two. And we can create those shared experiences through music. So I want to say a few thank yous real fast before I conclude. So I want to thank Iowa City Hospice, specifically Maggie, as well as you all for coming out today and Joel for filming it, and Hills Bank for providing the location, University of Iowa for my own education, as well as the Provost and the Art Share Committee for Better Futures for Iowans, and then Dr. Gefeller and Dr. Adamek who have supported me and 
helped me along the entire process. So thank you for all of your help. Are there any more questions that anybody has? Uh, in your studies, is it Jackie? Yes. Yeah, J Jackie. In your studies, uh, and maybe these young ladies back here can answer this question better. I don't know. Uh, have you have you read any studies from knowledgeable people as to what what is it that exactly triggers the emotions from music in the human psyche or as one author uh, believed that actually music reaches our very soul, what, what exactly is it that triggers that emotional response? Well, part of it is that it really does affect, through the research we can prove that it affects our dopamine levels. So it hormonally even affects how our bodies are working. Music can access every part of our brain simultaneously. So it can pull in all sorts of areas, which is why you can smell something and be taken back or hear that just the first part of that song and be taken right back to that place because it's accessing all those things the outside cues that we can get from the music but it's fascinating really when they're getting down we're getting more and more research so there is continuous research in that oh yeah yep but we look a lot at the cortisol levels from stress reduction and hormonally like dopamine and serotonin okay and my other question uh is this, uh, music, some types of music can have negative influences on people. Uh, maybe people hear a song that they associate with a negative experience, a breakup of a bad relationship or something. <laughs> you know, you could think of all kinds of examples. In your therapy, with, and when you're working with your clients and patients, uh, do you go a little deeper into their history to find out about maybe some of those negative experiences and perhaps even specifically what, what music, what songs maybe bring back bad memories to you? Yeah, we work very close with the family or with the client to figure out what their personal preferences are. Do they like country? Do they like that? Are there songs to stay away from? Are there songs specific to the first dance at the wedding that would be a great one to really go deep in a positive way, or the opposite, would that be a song to avoid? Um, yeah, music can go either way, but we, it, I mean, it's been used for torture and wars and playing loudly um, to hurt people's ears and stuff, but if it's done effectively, it can be very therapeutic. Is there any particular genre of music that you would, would never? Is there a, st a style of music that you would not even think about using. It's so devastating to the per person's emotional. <laughs> no, probably because to certain people, different things are very therapeutic. So what might not be good for you might be exactly what the next person needs. Um, I would probably avoid things that would send you into that <laughs> downward spiral like we talked about, but it's really personal preference and whatever works for you. And that's where music therapy is so flexible and we can bring in and adapt and do songwriting and different things. Yeah, good questions, thank you. Any other questions? Jackie, I was interested in your, um, when you were talking about the caregivers and the music for sleep. Yeah. I assume that would be good for the caregiver and for the person that's being okay. cared for. Yeah. Um, and I, on the slide you mentioned um, that it improves sleep or something to that effect. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yep, that specific study looked at how deep of a sleep, how deep into REM sleep that they were able to get. And I mean, there's all sorts of outside factors that were in, but they were saying that with the shortened amount of time to fall asleep, and then without some of those distracting outside noises that your body just tunes into, you were able to get into that deeper sense of sleep more quickly and more effectively so so is that have you ever seen that used for the the, the uh, person who needs the care um, of putting the radio on or putting some of those um, apps that you had at night and have you seen that have an effect 
Um, in my personal stuff, I haven't been there at night, but I know of other people that have used it at night. Um, it really can make a difference from hearing the sounds in the hallway or um, outside that your body tunes into. And I think that having that and having that comfort specifically can be really effective. Thank you. Yeah. I have a whole bunch of questions. Good. So, all right. All right. Um, just to talk about that music and sleep connection again, have you tried it? Yes. Yep. Do you use it regularly? Personally, I do, actually. Um, mine can't have any words, though, or else I focus on the words. So that's a personal preference for me. But as a person who likes to listen to the words and analyze the words, I can't have any of that kind of stuff when I'm studying or when I'm trying to rest. But it really does make a difference for me. And if I'm trying to take a nap in the middle of the day and my neighbors are in the hallway or something, it helps to mask those sounds. Mm -hmm. So is, is music generally more effective than a white noise kind of thing? Um, I think that would probably be personal preference. But okay. um. what, could you talk a little bit more about how it manages pain? You mentioned this in a couple of different points I don't I can understand how it might soothe someone but to actively manage pain is it simply distraction or yep it's distraction and it's the perception of pain so we have what's called the gate control theory of pain and your body is focusing and processing that instead of the pain because your body can only process so much and so it's reducing your perception of pain as well as bringing your stress levels down. And when you're tense, your pain is going to be worse. And if your heightened sense of anxiety, your stress and your pain is probably, your, or your perceived sense of that pain will be more extreme. So it can help with that as well. I have some studies I can email you if you would like to see them. I'll take your word for it. <laughs> it's just a curious notion. Um, I'm, I'm one of a group of sibling caregivers for a dad um, in a different state even. And um, we've seen music therapy being used in his facility. And um, it's, it's, it seems like using it with a group is entirely different than using it with a person. Um, for instance, he lives in Tulsa, Oklahoma, which is like one of the bastions of Protestant um, religious communities. You know, it's a highly, highly churched um, area. And so a lot of what they rely on for singing in groups is hymns. And, you know, that seems very specific for a group of people, but I think it's probably a pretty good bet in Oklahoma, right? Um, but I guess I'm kind of wandering here, but I guess my, my question is, are there playlists by certain demographics available, say like, or age groups or, you know, of a certain educational level. I realize this is very specific. Um, so, you know, I find myself at a loss personally, and my siblings and I have, have tried all different kinds of music, and it seems, it seems to just make him more anxious. Um, so, I, I, I don't know. Does it work for everybody? <laughs> I mean, no, it doesn't work for everybody. Um, it's not that catch-all thing. I might suggest finding songs that might be from when he was in his 20s if he doesn't want any of those other things. But when you're a younger adult, you have a lot of those memories with those songs and some positive experiences might happen that way. But no, it's not good for everybody. But the one-on-one, -on -one, if you could find somebody down there who's a music therapist, board certified, then they could help with that one-on-one -on -one finding what would work for him. Um, I know that in dealing with another aunt who went through dementia, that um, some of the last things that went 
for her were nursery songs, you know, little um, or rhymes or things that we that we all learned as children. Um, is that demeaning up to a certain point, or um, I guess you have to kind of take it on a person by person? I think it's person by person, and you want to make it age appropriate, but it you wouldn't go with a little rattle saying nursery rhymes, but you could do some sort of songwriting off of that, or you could use that song in a different way, or like if you are my sunshine, if you're using it with a wide group and a wide range of people and you're using drums or you're using clapping or you're using something with it, then that takes it up a level from just that rattle with that little infant. But. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Are there any other questions? I have a more specific question. Uh, more specific question regarding your uh, answer to my other question about, well, the music, uh, depending on the type of music, uh, whether it's in a major key or minor key, or whatever, uh, triggers hormones, s certain hormones. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me, th let me think of a, cr this is a crazy example probably. A uh, person's lying in bed listening to some relaxing music, you know, which I think is a, is a very good idea. All of a sudden, they hear uh, a fire engine siren on the street. Is that f the sound of that fire engine is going to trigger some anxiety? Maybe. <laughs> is it the same? Is it the same hormones that are triggered from both the relaxing music and the sound of the fire engine or police car? Um, no, I would say that that would just be the sound stimulus that would it might break up that relaxing moment, but if they're relaxing in bed, then they're already in that relaxed state, and then realistically, that siren's going by momentarily, and then they'll be still listening to that music in bed, and still, but that would just be, I would say that would just be a sound that's startling them, perhaps, but that wouldn't really trigger a whole lot, especially if they're in that relaxed state in bed already. I don't know if I answered that exactly how you were asking, but. Well, no, I, I, was just, I was just looking for your interpretation. That I was, uh, earlier this morning, I was on YouTube. Whoa, what a great website. <laughs> I can find any kind, of, any kind of music, any kind of music I want to listen to, I can find on mu YouTube. And I happened to stumble across his heavy metal piece. I, I, I was lured into it because it, it had a very deceptive title. Uh -huh. You know, it sounded like a really attractive song, but it turned out to be heavy metal. And wow, it was very disturbing to me. Right. But I got to thinking, well, there's a lot of people who would think this was just a beautiful song. Right. Yep. Which to me sounds really wild. Uh, so how do you know? How do you know whether heavy metal is going to influence a person to give them relax. <laughs> there you go. But also their verbal preference. You probably wouldn't tell me that you would like to have some heavy metal. <laughs> but it, I mean, you could if that's your personal preference. Or you could say country, or you could say rap, or you could say oldies, or really anything. A good friend of mine uh, was a chopper, pi excuse me, helicopter pilot during the Vietnam War. And, and often when they would. Uh, Carry, carry troops into a hot landing zone, uh, they would play rock music. Steppenwolf was big back then. So when he hears Steppenwolf, he thinks of the Vietnam War. Uh, I don't know if that's good or if that's bad. It would probably depend on his own experience with that song. I would say if it would take him to a not good place, I would probably not, if I'm trying to enhance his quality of life, I wouldn't necessarily go down that road with But yet him. as a therapist, you want to bring those memories out into the open so they can talk about it, perhaps. You don't want to talk about the bad ones? No, not at this stage. Okay. Yeah, at this stage of life, I would probably say that it, we're focused on quality of life and enhancing those experiences and bringing back the positives and 
working together. And so I, I would probably avoid some of those things that would take them down those paths. But, I mean, if you're working with a young man coming back from Afghanistan now and you're in the right setting, working with the right team of people, maybe it would be more appropriate. But you kind of have to go by where you're at and who you're working with, what their specific experience is in war with that song. Yeah. I'm wondering if there's been any research or work done re around um, rehab for stroke patients and survivors um, or in, and language development and that kind of thing? Yeah, there's a lot of research actually. Um, Colorado State University has a program or a type of music therapy called neurologic music therapy and they work extensively with the neurologic kinds of things like a stroke. So you can do things like rhythmic auditory stimulation where you're using those outside external cues to help cue, whether it's working on gait or speech cueing. Um, they have a wide range of... That sounds very interesting. What was the name of the university and where would you find some more information? Um, it's Neurologic Music Therapy and Carly actually behind you is trained in Neurologic Music Therapy. Um, but it's based in Colorado, in Colorado State. Yeah. Are there any other questions? I came late. Is there going to be some more, or is this it? I mean, when you get done talking. Um, I think this is it, as far as I know. I mean, we'll have refreshments, and we can talk, and we can... Okay. Be so together, but did you get a flyer or a handout? No. Okay, we'll it's make sure we get you one. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you. Thank you.